Specialty Story, session number 46. Whether you're a pre-med or a medical student, you've answered the calling to become a physician. Soon you'll have to start deciding what type of medicine you'll want to practice. This podcast is here to tell you the stories of specialists from every field to give you the information you need to make sure you make the most informed decision possible when it comes to choosing your specialty. Welcome to Specialty Stories. My name is Dr. Ryan Gray, your host here every week, bringing you new and great interviews with specialists from every niche of the medical world. This week is no different. I'm speaking to a community based neuroradiologist, a diagnostic radiologist. Now, Dr. Narayan Viswanathan has been out of fellowship training now for three years and is in the community in the Tampa area. And he talks all about his specialty, starting with what got him interested in radiology and then neuroradiology. I probably had a different path to radiology than most. You know, prior to applying, when I was applying initially for residency, I actually applied for internal medicine. And I applied to several programs. But as I was doing my uh, sub internships, uh, I kept, I kind of was drew more and more to radiology, because what I liked most about uh, internal medicine was sort of coming up with the differential diagnosis, and uh, sort of being, uh, trying to figure out what was the real root of the cause of the problem. And I thought that as I kept going in internal medicine, I was kind of going further away from that. So that led me uh, kind of during a radiology elective during my fourth year. Um, I really enjoyed sort of being the diagnostician or the doctor's doctor kind of thing. So that drew me to radiology. So then I happened to apply for both internal medicine and radiology. And neuroradiology was something that I sort of uh, grew towards as I was continuing my radiology residency. I just happened to really enjoy the the anatomy, the complexity, and um, how you know it was a very elegant system. And I thought this was something that I was really fascinated with. And I thought the developments in the technology and the functional imaging and all the different uh, crossroads between technology, and anatomy, and medicine kind of made me go towards neuroimaging and neuroradiology. As you were going through your radiology residency, were there any other subspecialties that were were drawing for your attention? Yeah, I mean, I was I was drawn towards more of the uh, modalities that sort of had a overlay with uh, MRI. So I I really enjoyed uh, musculoskeletal imaging, and I thought that, that you know sports medicine was always interesting. I thought it would be um, I like basketball, so I was like, like really sort of drawn to the, you know, uh, MRI imaging of the ankle, and so I, we have the, the subspecialty of MSK was something that I was interested in, um, and I think also we had a very strong training in my residency in body just body imaging, um, so cross sectional CT and MRI of the body, but I thought that since I was had a very strong um, background in body, I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to do further fellowship training in, in neuroradiology. What traits do you think make a good ra- uh, neuroradiologist? Um, I think that you really need to have, um, number one, a very strong knowledge base. Uh, so a detailed and comprehensive understanding of the anatomy. Uh, and, yeah, you know, a lot of times they say that uh, you can't play the game if you don't know the players. And I think that, um, you know, that's definitely the case for all of radiology, but definitely for neuroradiology, because there's so many fine, intricate anatomic structures that you have to be aware of. So I think comprehensive knowledge of the anatomy. Um, I would also say that having a good background in um, anatomy and physiology and also pathology, you know, because that's why... I think radiology is such a long um, residency, you know, in, in, in total, it took seven years. So I think good traits include knowledge of anatomy, uh, pathology, and also attention to detail because, um, 
you you need to sort of think about not just common stuff, but sometimes esoteric stuff can easily come into play and it can make big differences on patient outcomes. The other thing I would say is being an effective communicator. Uh, you typically have to work in interdepartmental uh, conferences with neurologists, neurosurgeons, uh, primary care doctors, ENT docs. So it helps to have, as well as oncologists. So it helps to have that sort of sort of personality, somebody who effectively communicates, and uh, so that clinicians can feel that you are somebody who they can go to, and um, and rely upon, so to to provide the best care for the patient. You're in a community practice. When you were leaving training in an academic center, what was the decision algorithm for you to to choose community versus academics? Yeah, I, I think uh, for me, I was I was torn between both because I I actually had applied to uh, an array of both academic and private settings. Uh, I did a two-year neuroradiology fellowship, so typically people who do two-year fellowships are more inclined to do academics, and I thought that was the career path that I, too, was going to choose, especially since I particularly enjoyed working with uh, other residents and medical students and and fellows, but um, I also enjoyed the... I, I felt that I was going to miss a lot of the aspects of radiology that I I grew to love, including the stuff that I was uh, strong in, in my residency and like body imaging and doing some procedures. Um, so I think that in the end, I kind of uh, thought of both avenues, but I just did not want, I did, I did not envision um, a career where I was going to focus on one subspecialty for the rest of my life because I enjoyed all those different aspects of medicine, medicine and and that's kind of what the beautiful thing about being a neuroradiologist, but working in a general setting allows me to do while I can have my um, sort of little niche of doing the thing I love most. I also have an ability to uh, do a little bit of everything, uh, both from a diagnostic and also a light interventional standpoint. So, and I, I, I base everything I, I tell uh, sometimes when we have students rotating with us, you know, I feel that I'm the. I get to utilize a little bit of, a little aspect of medicine that I studied. You know, all of medical school kind of somehow uh, still affects my day-to-day -day work, whether it's OBGYN or ophthalmology or pathology. So I really enjoy that. Um, so that's kind of why ultimately I said, you know what, let me choose this, and uh, we'll see how it goes. And it's going well. What percentage at this point of your practice? Would you consider neuroradiology? I would say about a third, you know, about a third of the time I spent is focused on neuroimaging, um, including reading MRI, um, CT of the brain, some advanced uh, imaging, whether it's, you know, head and neck, or uh, sometimes we do some perfusion at some of our hospitals, um, and then also temporal bone and things like that. So I would say about a third of my time spent is doing neuro. Yeah. It's kind of a coincidence we're recording this today because earlier today I was in the scanner getting uh, my brain and C-spine uh, scanned on my, my normal <laughs> intervals for, for following my MS, but that's oh, a, wow. it's a coincidence. Um, what, as as you're going through neuroradiology, uh, let's focus more on the neuroradiology side. What sorts of, besides MS, <laughs> what sorts of uh, scans are you reading? I, I, I dare to say patients are you treating and, and seeing as a neuroradiologist? I think that a significant percentage of the cases that we read are um, patients with ba back pain, you know, whether it's cervical or low back. Um, that would That's probably one of the most frequent causes of um, visits to the hospital or to the primary care doctor. And with that, imaging. Um, so that's a significant percentage. Uh, but, you know, th that's sort of the, that's one of the, one aspect, but then also patients with headache are frequently also imaged. Um, and then I guess trauma as it relates to uh, motor vehicle or other sorts of uh, blunt or penetrating trauma 
when I was in residency, I was in Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, which is uh, in the, you know in the inner city in North Philadelphia. So we saw um, significant amounts of uh, you know bullet related and other uh, types of trauma as it relates in that setting. But now I see more. Um, motor vehicle accidents and motorcycle type accidents. But so, you know, trauma, low back pain, headache, or I think bread and butter type stuff, uh, routine imaging. But then, you know, we also have uh, a cancer center and there is some um, neuro-oncologists in the community. And so we see gliomas and gl other glial tumors, both initial presentation um, as well as follow-up of those patients who may be on different therapies and sort of evaluating and monitoring responses to treatment. Um, you mentioned demyelinating disease. So patients who have different types of demyelinating disease and disorders, we evaluate follow-up temporal progression uh, or, or response to therapy. And then also um, from the, from an ENT standpoint, both um, typically we'll see patients for, who may have both in the pediatric and adult setting for hearing loss, whether it's conductive or sensory neural hearing loss. So typically uh, many of those patients will also get CT of the temporal bones or MRI of the internal auditory canals to look for varying entities um, causing those problems. And um, also uh, head and neck pathology. So tumors of the oropharynx or upper aerodigestive tract and and again sort of seeing follow up after they get treated so kind of a kind of a broad varying scope really yeah it's a lot of stuff i was i'm surprised to hear that it's that broad even though it's it's such a a small niche that's good yeah it, it's yeah it's really interesting cuz uh, and you know that's why at many academic centers it is such a focused um area and even in the community you know, they several clinicians and consultants prefer to have neuroradiologists uh, read specific studies because it, because of that added level of training often has uh, significant impacts on on patient care. It's kind of I was thinking about this kind of makes me think about a lecture I'm doing for radiology assistants uh, later in the week. But one of the things that I have in that is basically neuro imaging mimics, and it can often have significant impacts. One of the cases I show is a case of a subacute infarct, uh, which was diagnosed as a tumor. So if we call it, you know, and if it's, if we say, it's a t if somebody interprets it as a tumor, the, the neurosurgeon may do a craniotomy, but if the imaging can overlap with that of an infarct, you know, that's a big difference in, in treatment. Yeah. So a pr small percentage of patients will uh, because of misinterpre misinterpretation, will go and have craniotomies, and they just find. Uh, and you know, you mentioned MS. One of the areas which can mimic uh, a tumor is something called tumefactive MS, and where it's just a demyelinating lesion, but which looks like a tumor. And it does have some subtle imaging findings, but it's important for the for the radiologist, neuroradiologist, to know or say, hey, you know what, this may not just be. Uh, a metastatic or glial lesion. This could be something else that's not typical, such as tumefactive MS. So, you know, it, it, it often can have significant impact. So whereas yeah. a musculoskeletal image, if they say, hey, that ligament's kind of torn, maybe not torn, this can say, you know, if it's call it an infarct versus a tumor or an abscess, you know, it, it has significant implications on what they decide to do and patient outcome. Wow. Yeah. Describe a typical day for you. Um, so our days are very varied at my practice because we rotate between, um, hospital based and outpatient practice settings. But, uh, when, since I tend to go about 50% of the time to the hospital, I'll just start with that. Um, there, you know, uh, we typically will start with uh, the inpatient list um, our, since our practice is big at one of the larger, um, centers at Lakeland regional, you know, we have a big ER and inpatient mix. So, um, if I'm just assigned to the ER rotation, I'll just focus on ER, but a typical day may be for me, uh, you know, reading 
anywhere from 100 to 150 studies. And in that, I might do a mix of uh, X. I, I, in my current practice, I, again, a third of it will be neuroimaging related um, studies. So CTs of the brain, MRI of the spine, um, MRI of the, you know, the IAC or temporal bone, head and neck imaging, tumor follow-up, that kind of stuff. And then the rest of it will be more of the bread and butter, abdominal pain or patients with pancreatitis or appendicitis or other routine causes of abdominal pain and complications for patients in inpatient settings, evaluating those. And in my practice, uh, as a radiologist, we actually also do some light interventional procedures. So we might, it's actually kind of a nice break in is because we get to go and interact with patients, uh, do a, you know, a paracentesis or thoracentesis, lumbar puncture, uh, myelogram. I, I do some biopsies as well at my particular setting, and that's kind of geographic, whether a subspecialty radiologist does that. But where I practice, the, uh, the, you know, this, even the specialty radiologist will go and do things like lung biopsy or um, participate in a drain or something like that. So we, I, I actually really enjoy my day-to-day setting because of that mix. And, um, but yet I get to concentrate on one particular specialty. Do you have to take a lot of call? Um, our call is, I think, I guess it's all relative. Um, but for me, I don't, I think it's, it's about once a month. So, you know, and I think, uh, we covered both days on the weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, so what does that look like? And, is it, is it home call or do you have to go in at all? We, we go, uh, because we're sort of in a broad practice setting, we have very, many different positions and many different types of call. So, but typically we go in, um, and you're covering well, actually one, uh, set of calls, you know, focus on ER and others may focus more on inpatient and ER, but, uh, again, it really depends on being in Florida, the time of year, the time of season, the day, but it can be quite, quite busy. You know, again, um, volumes are high image, imaging utilization, it seems can sometimes be high. Um, and we also just serve a large community. So, um, it makes for a busy day, but we get through the work and try to do a good job. Do you feel like you have enough time for life outside of work? I do. Um, you know, I, I get, I get, uh, I think we get good time to, I, I have three kids. So for me, I think that's a priority. And I think choosing this specialty uh, allows me enough time to spend with my kids, you know, participate in their, in their development, school related activities, and, you know, take some breaks here and there. So I think it, it does afford a good balance between life and work. What does the path look like to get to be a neuroradiologist? The, the um, training path. So, the training path. I think you initially you have to know that it's it's a long one, and you have to be prepared for that. But uh, I think it takes you just have to be patient and not try to reach that end goal at the outset. So take it sort of one day or one step at a time. So after you know pre med four years of medical school. Then uh, after that, it's completed a year of internship, uh, which can be in both either a preliminary year in medicine or surgery, or some choose to do a transitional year, uh, followed by four years of diagnostic uh, imaging, diagnostic radiology. And then after that, uh, you would then, during your as a third year of residency, you would apply for a fellowship in neuroradiology. It's either a one or two year fellowship. I think many have increasingly majority of the fellowships are one year training programs, uh, but some still remain two years. Um, and so, so basically one plus four plus two. So in total, um, seven years of training after, uh, after medical school. How competitive is neuroradiology? Uh, I think that, you know, it's, 
it comes in waves, uh, and it also depends on uh, some academic centers are more competitive than others. But by and large, most uh, radiology residents uh, will secure a neuroradiology fellowship. Um, and, you know, I submitted a rank list just like um, for residency and most, I believe most uh, of individuals rank within their top three or four choices and most get, you know, between eight to 10 interviews. So it's, it's competitive, but not, um, I don't think it's as difficult as getting into medical school. What should a, a medical student be doing or now even a radiology resident who's interested in neuroradiology, what should they be doing to be competitive? I think that first, once they've developed that passion and know that that's the, the route that they want to uh, pursue, I think sort of having, it always helps during your fellowship to talk about, uh, a fellowship interview to talk about, you know, certain highlights that you may have had in the field that others may not. So whether that's participating in uh, research uh, related to neuroimaging, and I, I did several posters and uh, many abstracts related to neuroradiology that I would present at uh, national meetings like the American Society of Neuroradiology. Um, so I think thinking about pursuing either some sort of research-related activities in that field or even educational activities. Uh, I went to a, um, a very strong uh, didactic residency, which focused on residency education. And um, I would teach um, junior junior residents. So we would have medical students come and rotate. So while we would teach them, I would create lectures for um, them on certain neuro topics. Uh, and we also tr- uh, it w- there was also opportunities to teach um, the uh, technologists, radi- uh, the CT and ultrasound and MRI technologists of you know different aspects. So I think participating in research, educational activities are all good steps to take to make yourself most competitive. Do you see any major bias against DOs in the field? I don't. Um, And I think that we, many of the times I I don't, I'm not, it, you know, I don't realize whether somebody's an MD, DO, it's it's sort of a, not really something that's, uh, that comes to, fruition on a daily day-to-day basis um like you know they say if you're good you're good and uh, i don't think it matters whether you're md or do um so no not at all once you are fellowship trained in neuroradiology are there even more opportunities to further subspecialize yeah yes there is um and i think neuroradiology is one of those areas where you can do that. When I did my fellowship uh, at Brigham and Women's, we had uh, subspecial. We had basically neuroimagers that were focused on areas from functional MRI, uh, so basically evaluating, giving a patient certain tasks while they're in the scanner, and assessing different parts of the brain and where there is activity or not, and that could actually have important implica- implications for when a neurosurgeon decides to remove a tumor to make sure they're not impacting certain critical areas of the brain. Um, so we would have, there's a, so there's neuroradiologists that are focused exclusively on things like functional MRI or perfusion imaging as it relates to stroke or, or tumor. Um, and we had other radiologists when I was in uh, Boston Children's focusing on pediatric neuroimaging and there's pediatric neuroradiologists and pediatric neurointerventional radiologists or neurointerventional radiology. So those are additional areas, both, uh, uh, you know, so three additional areas of subspecialization may be pediatrics, um, head and neck, or neurointerventional. So I, uh, you know, many people would after their one or two year of diagnostic neuroradiology would do an additional year of pediatrics or uh, in some if you if there's an interest in doing interventional neuroradiology after their one year uh, one or two year neuroradiology fellowship they would do an additional uh, two years of 
interventional neuro training. Um, and we also had individuals that really were exclusively wanted to focus on head and neck. So that would be, in, there are also some places where you could do additional training for a year in that. So I think there's many. And then in the practice setting, it's really up to you what sort of path you want to create. Yeah. For the future primary care doc listening to this right now, what do you wish they would know in the future about neuroradiologists and what you do day in and day out to to better help their future patients? Um, I think we just uh, know that we are trying to provide the best uh, high-quality reads for their patients, and uh, we try to do... Uh, it's a good job, but with, you know, um, sometimes it's uh, with increasing turnaround time demands and increasing volumes, it can it can become difficult. But I know I always try my best to provide the most accurate report in a timely fashion. So uh, try to have some patience with us if at all possible. But um, also, you know, it all I think also for the primary care, the more information that we can have, the better uh, report I can provide. So a lot of times I, I know that the same way we're busy, the primary care doctors are, are becoming busier and busier. So, but if they sort of say, you know, give us an additional history when they provide those order entries, uh, that can actually be very helpful in localizing and sort of targeting our search uh, in, in, evalu- in finding pathology. As a neuroradiologist, what other specialties do you work the closest with? So we work closely with neurosurgery, uh, neuro-oncology, and ENT doctors. I think those would be the three main uh, areas that we work with. Uh, and it's good to have uh, rapport with your other surgical or clinical colleagues because a lot of times, you know, we just call each other on the cell phone or to frequently communicate because that way uh, we can provide quick uh, access to each other. And oftentimes it helps to have that interdisciplinary relationship to further improve the care of the patient. For some specialties, there is an easy transition into life outside of clinical work, whether that's going into industry or for nephrologists going in and managing dialysis centers. For neuroradiologists, what, if anything, is out there outside of clinical work? I think that there's there's some different avenues to pursue. Um, Whether I know of neuroradiologists that um, have chosen to go um, via, you know, working with the pharmaceutical industry and um, helping to basically evaluate certain disease uh, or therapies and drugs and evaluating disease response. So sometimes it's helpful to have somebody with an imaging background or a background of different imaging contrast agents and taking that to the pharmaceutical industry world and helping to evaluate both uh, drugs and other contrast agents and responses to therapy. Um, I also think that, you know, there's actually some um, eminent uh, neuroradiologists that have taken on work in fields such as public policy. Uh, So I think that's, I think the opportunities are endless. Um, So I think those are some areas that I personally know of people doing. What do you know now that you wish you knew before going into neuroradiology? Uh, I wish I knew it was going to be a a pretty challenging road. You know, I never realized that I kind of thought, Hey, I'll be a radiologist. And I thought it'd be something I'll just kind of do, but I, I kind of never anticipated and being a neuroradiologist, I never anticipated the, the number of years, you know, that it would take collectively. And I'd never thought about the number of examinations I was going to take. So (laughs) You know, <laughs> after the three steps to get into med- U.S. only step one, step two, step three to get into medical school, then there was also three board examinations. There was a uh, initial boards, uh, there was a physics boards during my second year of radiology residency, 
And then there was a written boards in the uh, third year. And then there was a uh, ever popular, which they don't have anymore, uh, which is either, uh, you know, neither here nor there, but there used to be this uh, very notorious uh, oral board examination for, um, so students would all fly to one particular place in Louisville, Kentucky, residents across the country. And there was this one hotel room where everybody would, you know, <laughs> be very stressed and anxious. And it was a very tough examination, but I think actually that was a good examination to sort of really prepare you for what I'm doing now. So there was the oral boards. And then I took a, after doing neuroradiology, then there was another subspecialty boards I took called the Certificate of Added Qualification in Neuroradiology provided by the AB American Board of Radiology. So that's called a CAQ. So you might see some people that say neuroradiology CAQ. So so I don't even know how many standardized tests that is. I can't count. So, you know, at least seven or eight um, to this. And But, you know, I think it's just uh, – it's just a unique thing about radiology. We have the opportunity. It's a it's an endless um, educational cycle. You know, it never ends. Yeah. I'm I'm learning and reading to this day, and uh, so and it's just it's kind of like no matter how much you read or try to stay on top of it, you, there there's just so much body of knowledge that continues to change, especially because of the technology components of it. And now now with there's things related to artificial intelligence, you know, so, and how that's going to impact uh, radiology on a day-to-day -day basis. And while, while some people are hesitant, it may actually uh, be an interesting opportunity for us to work, you know, side by side to help uh, artificial intelligence make us more effective and more accurate. So I think the, I think it's a really exciting field, you know, but I didn't think I was ready for all the the, the the challenges the day to day you know I think we, there's a poster that the the ASNR does the the ABR does basically it highlights the 14 years of training it takes to become a neuroradiologist and it has a picture of the brain and, and it sort of shows each area and during which step they're in but it's a long road but I'm glad I I chose it so let's talk about briefly the the major changes was going to be a question coming up, but since you brought up the the machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's it's funny when I talk to medical students or pre meds, they're like, "Oh, I'm interested in radiology." I'm like, "Great, just be aware that there are right. in in my mind." So I'm a huge tech nerd, and uh -huh. and and I think we as a society are underestimating what can happen in the next ten or twenty years when you look at where we came from 20 years ago, but most of everything that we do nowadays didn't exist. Um, and so I'm very interested to, to hear your thoughts as a diagnostic radiologist, um, where you think AI and machine learning will come into play for radiologists. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's really two, I think there's one body of people that are sort of scared and running away from it and are thinking that our field is going to end as we as we know it. But I think that re in reality, it's especially when we I look and think about the, our different radiology meetings and the leaders in our field, we're sort of embracing machine learning and I think thinking of different ways to have it improve and work in concert with it. You know, we've mm -hmm. already had some steps in machine learning for instance uh, you know i read mammography and we have cad which is computer aided detection for it sort of is another button we press and it helps to localize uh, masses asymmetries and calcifications and uh, th while it's while it's good in some areas you know it has limitations in others and i think that it actually works in complement with the radiologist majority of the time it's sort of for me, from my standpoint, it's not the most accurate. I mean, it's it's good in that it may localize some calcifications that I I may not have thought of, uh, I may not have recognized. But um, by and large, it's you know I'll be like, oh, the computer thought that that was what it is, but it's not really. There's some nuances to it uh, that having the that I think it's that it's not quite there yet. Uh, yeah. But there's definitely areas that I can see 
it sort of helping, you know, helping us. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's why we actually should be embracing the leaders in AI and the technical companies and think, cause I was actually thinking about that too. It would be nice to work with somebody to, to help the computer think about different algorithms and think about the way I interpret a brain and mm-hmm. why, I'd, because like some of those cases I told you, you know, like the tumor fact of demyelinating case or the, and because some of those things don't nicely, don't always nicely fit into some sort of algorithm that a computer may be able to pick out. But, but perhaps for our day to day, portable chest x-rays yeah you know it may be a useful adjunct yeah definitely and you know and that's what the thing though you know a lot of times in radiology it's kind of there's a little bit of an art to it you know every for instance if i were to go and say every little thing that looks different on an x-ray is a cancer i would have some upset clinicians because they said this this radiologist always recommends a ct and says clinical correlation for every single thing but uh (laughs) As you do more and more and read more and more, you kind of start learning some subtle patterns that, you know, whether it's some mass effect or it's pushing a vessel or um, just you kind of recognize what are some Asian shadows and things like that. So there's some areas that I think uh, the human brain is still pretty good at what yeah, it does, you know. Definitely. What do you like the most about being a neuroradiologist? I like finding things on people uh, that that don't that's not always expected. You know, I like to provide a re, uh, the answer to a patient's problem, uh, so that, and I like to provide it as early as possible. It's it's really while well, I find you know it's well it's many times obvious to find something with diffuse metastatic disease. It's it's especially you know it's it's rewarding to find something whether it's a small lesion that can be operated on and the patient can do well or a small nodule on a chest x-ray that is not a subtle lesion, you know, uh, and really affect the patient's cure early on in the disease. You know, and a, a lot of times I, when I'm reading a, for instance, a, a lumbar spine of the MRI, uh, I look at the other things. We always look at the, the whole study, but in fellowship, uh, they were, I remember reading a MRI of the lumbar spine for back pain, but I happened to find a, a, a Wilms tumor in the kidney and uh, the patient was able to get that resected and cured. So, you know, it's, and sometimes you may be the first one, you frequently are the first one to, to notice that. Or I, I find, you know, uh, nodules when I'm looking at shoulder x-rays uh, or just, just different pathologies all over it. And the more you look, the more you find. So that's kind of especially rewarding. So it's it's funny when you say you like to, to find things. I, I picture quickly, like you as a kid loving Where's Waldo. <laughs> yeah, that was probably my thing at the, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> what do you like the least about being a neuroradiologist? I think having to... Um, it's it's frequently difficult to multitask. Uh, so I think one thing that can be challenging is looking at a complex case and then, you know, having to juggle that between uh, maybe having to do, uh, you know, b- taking a phone call from a technologist or other things and just being able to juggle lots of different things. But I try to I try to resist the, the temptation to rush through things and just kind of take it one case at a time, you know, but I think you have to be able to multitask. If you had to do it all over again, would you still be a neuroradiologist? Yeah, I would. I would. I think that for me, uh, you know, you, you, it kind of goes in waves. But overall, when I think back, I, I'm very happy the the path uh, that I chose. I think it's a wonderful career, one where you can have a tremendous impact on on uh, both working with other clinicians and other doctors and healthcare providers, and also really impacting patients. You may not always get the recognition from the patients, but it's rewarding when you find stuff. I don't need the recognition. As we wrap up here, any last words of wisdom for the medical student, the radiology resident out there who's listening, interested in neuroradiology, uh, as they are traverse this path, uh, what words of wisdom do you have for them? I think about something my mentor told me, and especially this is useful for a radiologist is that when you 
a lot of times they say, oh, we got to get the list cleaned up. That's just something that, you know, we frequently say. Uh, but when we have to, we have to always remember that it's a list of patients and it's people's individual problems and, and uh, they're going through certain conditions and it's our responsibility to, while we need to get the work done, we need to remember that these are patients and it's easy to sort of get lost in that mentality of I got to just clean up the work, but to sort of stay grounded and think about that and also be, be patient and try to learn and do as much as you can. And I think for the medical student, you know, while you might, perhaps you're the one student who knew, who knew their, their knows they're going to be a neurologist from day one. I would say it's more important for that person to get knowledge in other areas. In fact, I would say do less of neuroradiology throughout your medical school and residency training because, you know, the more you understand the ophthalmologists or the, the, the surgeons know or the ENT docs or the pediatric oncologists, the more understanding you have of what they are looking for and what they want to know, the better neuroradiologist you're going to be. Same thing with doing more because um, – Increasingly, we are going to have to be able to do more and more procedures and be versatile. And I think that just during your training, try to do as much and learn as much as you can. All right, there you have it. Again, that was Dr. Narayan Viswanathan talking about diagnostic neuroradiology out in the community. If you're interested in neuroradiology, go back, listen again, and hear what Dr. Viswanathan had to say about it. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would love to hear from you. Just shoot me an email, ryan at medicalschoolhq.net. If you have any suggestions for a specialty or specialist that you would like to come on the show, shoot me an email. Don't just let me know what specialty you want to hear. Send me a name too so that I can interview him or her. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time here at Specialty Stories.